I said, in my mind, there is a 100% chance that I will be among the 20 to 30% of those that survive this because I'll do everything they did and a hundred times more. I'll do everything. I'm going to survive it. So yeah, let's start, I guess, with we're both authors. Tell me about how you got into this space. I read the book, but mm, okay. tell the audience if they're not familiar with your work, what you do. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm an author and a speaker. That was what I would say uh, professionally. That's what I do now. Um, the uh, This started when I was 20 years old. I was a top Cutco sales rep. So I was one of the top sales reps for the company and I was speaking at all of their events often. I'd speak at most events. And one night driving home in my new Ford Mustang that I had bought with my own commissions. So you're like high on I'm success. living the dream. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, right, my own apartment. I got, I got this new Mustang I bought three weeks ago. And uh, driving home after I gave a speech at a conference, um, my car was hit head on by a drunk driver at 70 to 80 miles per hour by a large Chevy full-size truck. And I was, I spun off the drunk driver and the car behind me, uh, T-boned me in my door at 70 miles per hour. And so if you could imagine, I always give people that visual, like look over your left shoulder and imagine a car hits you in the door at 70 miles an hour. The entire left side of my car crushed the left side of my body and I broke 11 bones instantaneously. My arm broke in two pieces. Um, my elbow was shattered. I broke my leg in half. I broke my pelvis in three places. My eye socket shattered. My ear was almost completely severed. Um, and uh, I, I, my heart stopped. So I was found dead at the scene um, when the paramedics got there. My heart didn't stop immediately. When they pulled me out, they cut me out of the car with the jaws of life. And when they pulled me out, the car was keeping me alive, like the pressure from the door. And when they pulled that off, I had already been losing blood for an hour. And when I lost enough blood, I, I, I was clinically dead. And so my heart stopped for approximately six minutes and they immediately no rushed me onto a medevac helicopter and started performing CPR. And um, the uh, uh, thank God they didn't give up after you know three, four minutes because it was like six minutes later that they got my heart beating again. Now, and, I know this yeah. isn't the point of the story, Go but ahead. did you have any, do you remember any spiritual experience or anything no. because of that time? I get asked that a lot, um, but the most common or a very common injury in a head-on collision is it's frontal lobe damage of your brain because your your brain, your whole body's going 70 yeah. miles per hour yeah. and now you, it stops and your brain hits your skull yeah. at 70 miles per hour. So I don't remember, my last memory is getting on the freeway that night, probably a good 20 minutes before the accident. And then my first memory is two weeks after the crash, a week after I'd come out of, I was in a coma for a week. And in my first, my first memory, I don't remember those two weeks. Like there's no, no part of my life do I remember what happened. Um, but when I'm asked about like near death experience, it's always, I have this deep spiritual knowing through meditation, through prayer, through plant medicine, through all sorts of experiences of like, no, this is part of your journey. Uh, you were meant to go through this and and more, um, and uh, and then share this experience, utilize this to help other people, and then mm. you know, which so that kind of gave birth to my life's yeah. work. Is like I wrote my first book based on that car accident. I started speaking at high schools and colleges, and eventually corporations, and you know that that kind of led me on that path. Mm. So you. I mean, gosh, six minutes, like that is it, no joke. Yeah. They work on you, thank God. You, Your first memory after that is you said two weeks later. Mm -hmm. How are you physically? During that first week, I flatlined twice more. So I was very unstable um, and uh, they couldn't even do, sur like I had all these broken bones and I was my body wasn't stable enough to do surgery. Uh, so I think, not initially, but I think within like four or five days, um, they started performing surgeries. And so I've got a 14 inch titanium rod in my leg to this day. Um, you know, it's been 24 years. Um, I've got two screws in my elbow. I've got a rod in my arm. I've got three metal plates in my eye. Um, and, uh, and so I come out of the coma and I'm told, okay, you know, first of all, I'm like waking up going, what, 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 ha what happened to me? And, uh, and I had brain damage. So my short term memory was non-existent. And so I would like fall asleep and wake up and be like, wait, where am I? Like over and over. so my poor parents oh my had God. to like relive, like telling me, you know, I always joke with them. I'm like, it probably got annoying after a while. You're like, look, you were in this car accident. Okay, <laughs> yeah, you're you alive. Yeah, you need that you video that Drew Barrymore has in 50 First Dates. And yeah, like, yeah. It, Adam was, Sandler comes and dude, plays it for you every life. morning. And, and by the way, 24 years later, it's it's like 80%, 70% better. Like my my daughter's here, she'll, she, yeah, she's laughing over there. She'll like, she'll, you know, my family always, I always say they'll vouch for the brain damage. It's very real. It's not an excuse. It's not like some made up wow. thing. Um, but so I had to face this 
reality, I was told, okay, A, you have permanent brain damage. We don't know how bad it is. Uh, you might be blind in your left eye forever. It was bandaged because they didn't, you know, the eye socket broke. You might be deaf in your left ear. Again, it was bandaged that we won't know until we unwrap things. Um, and, and then the kicker, the hardest is you're probably never going to walk again. And that was like, oh, like I'm 20 years old. Like that's, you know, and, and within a matter of days, I decided I will accept the worst case scenario. If I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life, I will be at peace with it. And this is what I told my parents. I will be the happiest, most grateful human being that you have ever seen in a wheelchair. Cause I'm in a wheelchair either way. And I will not let that define like my mental and emotional well-being. That is I get that to choose your personality? that. Was that your personality before the wreck too? To just sort of accept and then go? Not exactly. So it, it's interesting when I was, so a year and a half prior, I started my Cutco career. And on my second day of training, my my mentor, uh, my, my trainer, my manager, Jesse, he said, you guys, you're about to start in sales. And most of us were college students, right? So we're like, this is new for us. And he said, sales uh, is a microcosm for life's adversity, but it's accelerated and it's amplified. He said, so the average person occasionally would face rejection. You're gonna face it every day on the phone, 12 times on, you know, in person. He said the average person fails occasionally, like maybe they set their New Year's resolutions and 12 months later they fail. You're gonna to fail to hit your daily goal, your weekly goal, right? So he's getting all of us go like second guess our, wait, what are we doing here? Uh, and he said, you need a strategy to overcome adversity quickly and move through it. We're like, okay, we're all ears. And he said, I'm gonna teach you guys the five minute rule. And the five minute really said states, it's okay to be negative when something goes wrong, when you have a no sale or a canceled order, or you're disappointed or you're upset. He said, but literally he taught us to set our timer on our phone for five minutes. And we got five minutes to bitch, moan, complain, cry, vent, punch a wall, tell somebody, whatever. And he said, give yourself five minutes to fully process your emotions, express them, don't suppress them, express them. And he said, but when the timer goes off, now you, that's the moment of decision. And he, he said, he taught us these three words, real simple, can't change it. He said, when the timer goes off out loud, say, can't change it. And you're acknowledging to yourself, I can't change what happened five minutes ago. So right now I can either feel terrible about it, dwell on it, wish it didn't happen, resist reality, create emotional pain for as long as I want, or I can accept it. And I might not be happy, but I'm at peace, right? And like later on reading Eckhart Tolle and stuff, I'm like, oh, right. that's what I learned <laughs> when I was 20 in this really like simple layman's implementable yeah. way. So when I came out of the coma, the doctors called my parents and after I was out of the coma for a week and they had met with me and talked to me and you know visited me in the, in the hospital, psychologists and this and that. And they, they sat my mom and dad down and they said, we're concerned with Hal. My parents were all ears and they said, Mental or physically, he's stable. He's made it through the worst. You know, now time will tell w w where things end up. They said, but uh, mentally and emotionally, we believe that he's in denial or he's delusional because he's always smiling and laughing and, and joking and making us laugh. And they said, frankly, that's not normal for a 20 year old young man that's being told he's never going to walk again. So we need you to find out how he's really feeling. Like he's probably scared and depressed and sad and angry and he's like suppressing these emotions, right? So my dad comes in and I said, dad, remember, I, he, you know, he tells me their concerns. I said, remember, I live by the five minute rule. It's been two weeks since the car accident. I can't change what happened to me. So why, what's the point in continuing to be sad and scared and angry and depressed? Like this sucks. I'm going to enjoy every moment of my life, whatever that looks like. Yeah. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me. So I'm going to enjoy every moment that I have left, you know, so. Incredible. How did morning routine weave its way into this? How did mm. that become this modality to make change from like, okay, I accept what's happening, yeah. but I need something. Yeah, so it it was a very organic process and it wasn't, I was not a morning person. In fact, when, my, when I wrote the book initially, my friends were like, you were like the, we couldn't get you out of bed in college or, you know, but so it was, uh, what was it? I was 20 when the accident happened, 1999. And then it was 2007 when the U.S. economy crashed. Um, I had left Cutco, I'd hit Hall of Fame, and I was like, okay, now I wanna be an entrepreneur, I wanna start my own business. And so I, I was like, what am I qualified to do? I go, all I've done is sell a lot of knives. Ooh, what if I coach other Cutco reps and they pay me to coach them on selling yeah. that, right? So that's how I like transitioned. And, um, and then I wrote my first book, Taking Life Head On, about the car accident, um, and self-published it. And then, uh, you know, not, not like to be a big seller, just like I wanna share my story, you know? And, 
And then a couple of years later, the economy crashes and I start losing my clients right and left. And I'm such an optimist. Like th there's a fine line I always say between optimism and delusion, yes, right? Like yes. and we, we, you, you cross it often, yes, I cross yep. it often, right? Uh, and I think it's better to err on the side of, you know, the, the optimism delusion paradigm. But um, I, when the economy is crashing and people are talking about, you know, I'm like, I don't, I don't pay attention to that. And I don't watch the news and I create my own reality in my own economy. I create my, you know, right. Which is, th there's some merit to it, but no, yeah. it's like, no, no, my clients, they're realtors and now they can't sell houses and now they're canceling their coaching because they can't afford me. Yeah. So in a six month period, keep a long story short, I lost over half of my income. I couldn't pay my bills. I had just bought my first house a year and a half prior after I left Cutco. Um, I had to foreclose, which was like so yeah. identity destroying, like what? So um, I'm engaged to be married. Uh, uh, we're pregnant with my daughter, I believe around this time, right after we got engaged, we were pregnant and then uh, move in back with my dad. So I'm 30 years old now, moving back in with dad, you know, like this is, and I just had it at my own house and I was a hall of famer. Like I had just reached the pinnacle, what right? Happened? And so, yeah. so w what gave birth to the miracle morning was a Jim Rohn quote. I was, my buddy said, Hey, listen to this audio. Cause he knew I was struggling. And he said, this audio really helped me. And Jim Rohn said, your level of success. And this is in every area of life, by the way, your relationships, your marriage, your health, you name it, your level of success in every area of life will seldom exceed your level of personal development. And that was like, and I'd probably heard the quote before and just let it run in one ear. Isn't that real? Like all right? Jim Rohn quotes, you're like, I've heard this 10 <laughs> times, but on a particular day, yes. it will mess you up. Yeah. You're like, oh my God. Yeah. 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 And so what, like for me, I quantified it. I went, okay, wait a minute. My level of success, which on a scale of one to 10, every human being I believe wants level 10 health and happiness and financial security. Like no humans, like I don't want to be too happy. I'll take right. like a six or yeah. I don't want too much money. Right. Like, you know, there's this innate drive and desire in all of us to self-actualize um so i went okay i want level 10 success so then if it's if my level of success won't exceed the level of personal development that i have w what's my level of personal development and i had to really like google well what is personal like there was this like under it's a it, it's a question that needs context right mm -hmm. and then the way that i defined it is personal development is what are you doing each day right what are the rituals the routines the practices that you you teach rachel um that are enabling you to develop yourself into the best version of yourself, that level 10 version of you that's capable of creating and sustaining the level 10 success that you want. And my answer to the question of what level of success, 10, what's my level of personal development? Like two, like three or four. Like I'm, I, I was depressed, I was scared, I was living on credit cards, I was moving back in with my dad. And so I run home, I was on a, a run and I Google, what do the world's most successful people do for personal development? And I figure I'll take like the top one or two practices. But I ended up with a list of six. It was meditation, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, journaling. And so I've got this list and I'm overwhelmed. I'm like, well, okay, which one's best? So I'm going back in the articles. I'm reading this article, that article. I'm watching this video. I'm like, there is no clear winner. Like there is no, some people say it's journaling. Some people say it's, right? So then I almost threw in the towel. I was like, ah, I'm overwhelmed, like forget it. No, I try, you know, this is too much. And then thank God, and literally, thank God, you know, that the, a voice, something was like, what if you did all of them? What if you woke up tomorrow 30 minutes earlier and you did the six most timeless, proven personal development practices that the world's most successful people in all walks of life, from Olympic athletes to CEOs to, you know, have sworn by for centuries. I go, and it's like, wait a minute, that theoretically, that would be the ultimate personal development ritual that would enable me to become the level 10 version of myself as fast as humanly possible so that I could turn my life around. And that was the birth of it. And then I went, well, when am I gonna do this? I'm so busy. And then like, you know, again, keep a long story, not too long. It's like, God, the morning's like the only time that makes sense, right? Like, and if I do it in the morning, I'll start every day in a peak physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual state so that I can show up at my best to my work instead of stressed to my work, right? And within two months, I doubled my income. And we can talk, like, we can get, I want to get granular with that at some point on like, yeah. it was 2008. The economy was at the worst and I doubled my income in two months. But it happened so fast and I started training for an ultra marathon because I hated running <laughs> and my depression lifted day one, literally. And I remember on the two month date, I went to my wife, I go, sweetheart, I signed on two more coaching clients today. She's like, congratulations, sweetie. I said, no, you don't understand. We've officially doubled our income since I started the morning routine two months ago. It feels like a miracle. And without skipping a beat, she goes, it's your miracle morning. I go, I like that. And I wrote it down in my schedule. 
And then I started teaching it to my coaching clients. They initially resisted. I'm not a morning person. I go, neither was I. Here's how you beat the snooze button. And then it worked for them. And then I went, okay, well, if it worked for them and worked for me, like, I have to write a book. Okay. We're speaking the same language because mm. same, like, absolutely. When I first got into personal development and I didn't even have that those words for it, I didn't even really, you were ahead of the curve. Mm. I was just sort of like, I want to feel better and I don't really know what to do. Yeah. I had to do it in the morning because I'm a mom and I have kids and it really was the only time I could find for myself. Yeah. So years later when I would start to do conferences and write and different things, that is always my first piece of advice to people is get up an hour earlier yeah. than you normally do yeah. and use that time to work on yourself. Like, And you can fill that out or make that what you want it to be, but everyone starts by saying, I don't have time, yeah. I don't have time. And I remember I, the first personal development conference I went to was UPW. And I remember Tony said something, you know, everything with him was like very black and white, but he was like, if you don't have an hour, you don't have a life. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's real. Wow. Because of course I have an hour. I'm using it to watch TV. Yeah. I'm using it Scroll to like, your phone. yeah, just do stupid things that don't matter. I have an hour. I'm just using it for something that doesn't matter as much as this does. Yeah. So I guess let's start at the top of that list mm. with why the morning, why that space? I mean, yeah. I have my own theories yeah. as well, but I know you've got opinions on that so when it when i first came up with these six practices right and by the way th this will help i'll fast forward to give people a, a context here or a, or a framework so these are now known as the savers so when i was writing the book i was like i had these six practices and i went to my wife and again she's my muse i call her my muse i realized oh you're my muse like yeah literally god put you in my life for lots of reasons more important than that but that's one of them um but i remember i was working on the book and i was like i got writer's block and i was frustrated and i remember seeing her in the hallway of my dad's house we moved back in and writing the book and i uh i said sweetheart i said she goes you look frustrated what's going on i can tell i said I've got these six practices, but I didn't invent any of them. They're, everyone knows about them. Meditation, affirmation, right? Like, and I said, and, and, and I said, all these other authors, like they've got this freight way of like connecting everything, like the seven habits of highly effective people. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki has the cash flow quadrant, right? And I go, I've got these hodgepodge practices that I didn't invent and I can't figure out a way to make them like synergistic and memorable. And she goes, why don't you get a thesaurus and see if you can swap out some of the words and put together an acronym? It's like, I kissed her on the face. I'm like, you're brilliant. And meditation became silence. Journaling became scribing. And those are the bookends of the savers. S-A-V-E-R-S. -E silence, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, and scribing. So just everybody has that, that, that you can picture. Okay, so that's where we're, we're heading towards. Um, when I had these six practices written down, I went, okay, when am I gonna do them? And I wasn't a morning person. Like, you know, that's, and that's a story. In fact, let me, I'll, I'll, let me share this. I want to share why I believe that we don't believe we're morning people for most people, because I, 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 this is, this is my theory. If you think about it, when we were growing up, almost, this is true for almost everyone. When we were growing up, we were woken up by our parents against our will, right? <laughs> yeah. Nobody was like, Hey mom, wake me up tomorrow at 6am yeah. so I can get ready for school and be yeah. on time for the, butt, right? No, said no kid ever. So we were woken up by our parents against our will and we resented being woken up and we resisted it. And that happened our entire childhood while our brains were developing. So of course we're not morning people. And if given the chance to sleep in, we took it. A yeah. weekend, or Christmas break, for spring break, right? We would do it. And so what happens is you turn 18 and you're like, ah, I'm out of the house. I got no accountability. I got nobody looking over me. Like, so for me, I would play video games till five in the morning, schedule my first college class for whatever the latest 11 a.m. or whatever, right? That, and that's like most people. So I really believe it's not that we're not morning people. And I know about chronorhythms and I've, I've had, you know, had discussions with doctors about that, but it's that we developed a limiting belief that says, I don't like waking up early and I'm forced to do it against my will. And if I'm not forced to do it, I will not do it. Yeah. And I think that our, in a lot of ways, life is in some ways, it's like a downward spiral for some of us where it's like, we're now, because if you start your day, if you wait to wake up in the morning until the last possible minute, it's like you're telling the universe or God or your subconscious, I know I say I want an extraordinary life, but not as much as I want to lay here unconscious. Right. Wait, snooze button. Yeah, nine more minutes of just laying on. I know I could wake up and learn and grow and evolve and, and work on my goals, but I'd rather, right? So that's where I had that epiphany and I'm like, I've got to do this in the morning. 
Like I've got to start my day this way. And the, here's the cool part for anybody that's like, oh, I don't know. I like, I can't, I don't like waking up in the morning. That night I set my alarm for, normally I'd wake up at 6 a.m. just for work, right? So I set my alarm for 5 a.m., which was like the ungodly. I'm like, who gets up at 5 a.m.? I'm like, oh, really successful people yeah. do. But, but I'm like, unless it's like an early flight for a vacation, I was never waking up at 5. But so I set my alarm for 5 and all of a sudden as I go to bed and the night before I had brought on my computer six tabs meditation how to meditate how to do affirmations how to visualize because most of these were foreign to me and th that night i felt like a kid on christmas eve and keep in mind this is while i'm in debt like the day before i went to bed depressed and scared and dreading waking up in the morning right. and the next day because i had a, a, a this thing in the morning that might change my life i went to bed like a kid on christmas eve going oh my gosh like i'm excited and when the alarm went off i jumped out of bed i went in the living room and like n that was f four no yeah, 15 years ago and like never look back. Yeah, you need your own why to get out of bed, right? Yeah. Like go getting out of bed because you have to wake up, because you have to go to work, because you have to make money, because you need to pay your rent. You know, or getting out of bed because you have the baby's crying and you need all of those things. When you have a reason to get out of bed that is for you, mm -hmm. it changes the game. Yeah. And I am a morning person, yeah. but I was not a morning person until I built a morning routine. Mm. Yeah, ri yep. Very similarly, and it was that, okay, this is the only time I have to do it. I really want this time for myself. The first few mornings sort of like, okay, I'm doing this. But I have to say for people who are listening, like sometimes you're not gonna love the thing until you start to get the effects of what totally. the thing does. Yep. I never liked running until I passed a mileage point where I was like, holy crap, I can run two miles and not die. Yeah. I didn't know I could do that yep. thing. And I talk about this all of the time that we need more moments in life where you think, I cannot believe I just did that. Yeah. And it may even be, I cannot believe I got out of bed at five. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe I took a walk. I cannot believe that I drank a bottle of water before I had my morning coffee. Like whatever it is, it's those little shifts that make you crave the feeling of that thing. Totally. I'm such a dork. My I've been doing morning routine for so long that I wouldn't necessarily say that the joy of a morning routine is like popping me out of bed. Yeah. But I laugh at myself every time if I'm reading a book I find really interesting because more I read in the morning. Yeah. I'll go to bed and it's on my nightstand and I will wake up before the alarm. Yeah. I'm like, ooh, I want to <laughs> read more about this. Like, tell me about physics. Totally. Such a nerd. Such a nerd. But you need a thing that's just for you yeah that's not nobody else is asking this of you this is not for your kids this is not for your partner this is yeah. not for anybody else this is you taking ownership of your life that might take a few rounds of doing it totally. before you get the effects the problem is most people do it once yeah and give up yeah. or maybe they don't even do it once they hit the snooze button you know what i'd rather sleep yeah I do want to add one note because this is something that has changed in my life since, you know, 15 years ago when I started this practice is, I know you're a dude, but one of my favorite things to talk about is hormones in women. Mm -hmm. um, my hormones I've experienced have, those from yeah, before. Yeah, right. <laughs> my hormones have changed in the mm -hmm. last five years especially, and I started to feel really lethargic in the morning. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't get out of bed and I thought, you know what? It's because I've put in the time, I've put in the effort, my body's changing, I'm tired, I'm gonna honor this feeling, I'm gonna sleep, and I, it just kept getting later and mm. later and later. I'm like, this is crazy. I'm like a, I'll pop out 4.45. Like I'm a, I wake up early. Yeah. So it was like 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30. Now it's like seven. I'm like, what is going on? And finally talked to my doctor. And I had blood work done and was really low in, something had to get on a supplement that fast to turn back around so it wasn't that you were meant to sleep in it, it wasn't was, yeah. that i was meant to sleep in so i do want to mention that because i don't know if i've actually said that mm. on the podcast yet for people who are listening and your like your energy has changed and it's not a mindset it's not a motivation you're just like god i'm really physically i'm sleeping eight nine hours and i'm still waking up exhausted yeah it's worth just checking in on that one because that was such a game changer for me and i'm back reading about physics at 4 30 in the morning so nice for yeah. what that's worth yeah well do, and i think following up on what you said in terms of you've got to experience the benefit of it and yeah. then it gets addicting yes right like Absolutely. the morning routine is 
I mean, my first Miracle Morning was the game changer. In fact, the new edition. So there was, you know, I wrote the original Miracle Morning book and I self published it in 2012. And then the new updated and expanded edition with 70 new pages just came out in December. And um, I want, I wanted to, you know, when I wrote the original book, all the stories were like my coaching clients because nobody read the book, right? So that's where only Miracle Morning people were the coaching clients I had. But now, you know, now millions of people have done the Miracle Morning. And so for this new book, I reached out to my community and I'm like, hey, I really want a lot of different cool stories. One of the stories uh, was Keith Minnick and he was featured in the Miracle Morning documentary. So I already knew his story and I reached out to him specifically. And he was the former business director of Turner Home Broadcasting. And we met at a conference and he told me the story in person. And then I asked if we could feature it in the book. And it was that his son died and he went into a deep depression. And this depression lasted for about a year. And he had read books on grief and he had read books on, well, you know, all sorts of, any, any book that could hopefully help him. Uh, and it really caused depression that affected his work and so on and so forth. A friend said, hey, you should try this book, The Miracle Morning. And he came, he told me that his very first Miracle Morning, his depression went away. He said, because it just shifted his perspective, yeah. right? It's like Wayne Dyer, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And he went, oh, I've been depressed because I've been resisting my reality. I've been wishing what happened didn't happen instead of embracing, hey, this is how my life is now. How am I going to move forward? And he said, my very first miracle morning, I moved forward. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, he said, I'm still, I still do the miracle morning every day and it, it is still evolving. And so my point being that you can experience those benefits really quickly, yeah. right? Like his was day one, mine was day one. I was like, if I do this every day, it's only a matter of time before I become the person that I need to be to turn my life around. Like, this is it, you know? And so, yeah, yeah but I relate to your so running cool. examples, like to someone that, you know, never ran and then you're like, oh wait, I can run. Yeah. You know? Well, I think too, it has the ability and sounds like it, it was this case with your, with Keith. that part, with Keith. Yeah. It disrupts the pattern. Mm, mm. You are in a pattern. Someone listening to this right now is in a pattern. You're doing the same thing yeah. over and over. It's like that, you know, this is the I'm definition of crazy. Yeah, yeah, you want a different result, but you're doing the same thing. And for as long as I've been talking about this idea, because all I'm ever sharing in my work is like, hey, this is what I did and it worked for me. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it might work for that's you too. That's how I do, yeah, yeah. That's, that's me too. Um, so for as long as I've been sharing it, so many people will push back and be like, how is that gonna fix anything? Yeah. How is that, you're telling me, you know, to drink more water, <laughs> you're telling me to practice gratitude, like I can't pay my bills, how is that gonna, and I'm like, we don't do these practices so that life you know, snaps your and all the things in your life that are wrong suddenly flip in the other direction. We do these practices to ground ourselves, to change mm -hmm. our perspective, to change the way we see the world. And it's funny because the pushback will always be, this is too simple, there's no way that it works. And I'm like, you have not tried the thing. Yeah. Just do the thing. Yep. This, no part of this costs money. No, it's literally just your time, yep. it's your effort, it's your energy. It's try something with an open mind and an open heart and see, are the results different? See yeah. if Tuesday felt better than Monday did because you tried something different. So if we're waking up in the morning, we're gonna, the first thing we're gonna do, say verse, first thing we're gonna do is silence. What does that look like? And is it in this order or it doesn't really matter the order? It doesn't matter, do? yeah. Because like if they're... I meditate first, I'm falling back asleep. Uh, I'm I get not that, I lie. get that a lot, yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, so I talk a lot about like customizing your miracle morning to fit your preferences, your lifestyle. Um, and so the savers can be done in any order. Uh, I personally like to actually start with silence because you know my brain's still half asleep and if I stimulate too much, then it's harder to get back into that meditative state. Although sometimes, depending on the book that I'm reading, if it's a book, like right now I'm reading Ben Hardy's The Gap and the Gain, uh, I'm rereading it. Such a good book. Such a good book, right? Freaking love him yes I love do you him. know him yeah he's fantastic yeah i'll, I'll connect Go. oh I've, he's been on the show oh yeah yeah, okay. yeah, yeah i love up. him yeah love him so um the uh uh so i'm rereading the gap in the game so that's the type of book right where it's like a, any book that optimizes my mental or emotional state right through a, a, a way of looking at things a paradigm um i will read that before i meditate sometimes because i'm like that'll put me in a different headspace and then I can sink into that and, you know, meditate. I use the word marinate sometimes. To me, it's kind of the same, right? You're, if you're marinating in a certain emotional state, you're hardwiring it into your nervous system and now it's going to become part of who you are, and right? But to your point, um, like you say, people, well, how is that going to change anything? Like my, I'm 50 grand in debt. So if I just wake up earlier, I'm still 50 grand in debt, right? But 
here's the thing, Michael, I think it was Michael Singer, and I don't, I can't remember the like exact quote, but I'll paraphrase. He essentially in one of his, I think it was the new book of his, um, he said, if you can figure out how to be up all the time, meaning like you're actually enjoying the moment, no matter what's happening in the moment, right? Life's crazy, it's chaotic, there's debt, there's this, there's that. But if you actually learn how to optimize your mental and emotional state so you feel really good, he's like, who cares what's happening, mm. right? At the end of, and there was another person I heard say, at the end of life, when you think, who's the most successful person? You look at the, well, they had the biggest house and they had the biggest bankroll and they, right? They, they had the coolest cars, but it's like, well, who was the happy, who actually enjoyed every moment of the one life that we were all blessed to live? Right. I think they won. I think they were the most successful. So all outer change, all external change starts with internal change. And if all of a sudden, like for me, I was 52 grand in credit card debt and I was depressed about it. And to your point, right, we keep living not only the same like logistical behavioral loop every day, but the same thought patterns every day. And so if you're 50 grand in debt and I was depressed every day and more depressed as the debt grew from 50 to 51 to 52 and my very first miracle morning, I'm like, oh, ev I'm looking at everything differently. And right. now that 50 grand in debt is actually not depressing. It's an opportunity. Interesting. How might I get out of that debt? Yeah, and I wanna, let's touch on that yeah. because that's the kind of thing again where someone might hear it and they're like, how is that an opportunity? First of all, go read The Obstacle is the Way because mm -hmm. that will mess your whole <laughs> perspective up. Yep. But it really does shift your perspective. I think meditation especially, at least for me, because it allows me to separate myself from the thing I've been drowning inside mm -hmm. of. All of a sudden I'm out of this you know, chaotic ocean water and I'm looking at what it is and then it becomes I'm $52,000 in debt. What would it take for me to get out of that debt? And then who would I have to become? What is the work yep. I would have to do? How would I have to level up with these clients? How would I have to bring in income? How would all of that change in order for me to get out of debt? And the beauty is who you become in order to take on that obstacle is the thing that actually once you're out of debt, now you have this these tools in your toolkit yep. that you use to get to the next level of your personal evolution, that you use to buy the family a house again, that you use to take someone on vacation. You use the skills that you got overcoming the obstacle and they were the solution all along. Yep. But if you're just living in, oh my gosh, I have this looming, scary, terrifying thing, it's impossible uh, at least for me, those times in my life, I just was um, frozen in mm. fear, just mm. frozen. And every day was like more of the same, just like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And it was only once I could separate myself from that feeling, separate myself from the anxiety. And I wanna say there's a big difference between separating yourself and numbing yourself. Mm. Because when I was f more than one time in my life, that I've been overwhelmed in that way or having like severe anxiety. I'm like, oh, well, I'll just have some wine. Like that'll yeah. be the thing. And it, you trick yourself into believing that it's separating you from the problem, but it's actually just sort of muting the edges and like bringing a sort of shield down that is, yeah. but when that lifts, the still it's there. still there. Yeah. The difference is like, oh, I am not this thing. Mm. The, the practice of meditation is like, separating yourself from your thoughts, your observe, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, That's an interesting way to look at that. Yeah, So that it doesn't feel like you're in it. Yeah. Um, it's funny, because these are very simple practices that have these like universal sort of reaction in our body. Yeah, that was so well said, and I think it reminds me of, I don't know if it was Jim Rohn or, you know, everything came from Let's Jim Rohn. Let's just talk about Jim. Jim, I yeah. mean, really, Where's, didn't it though? Yeah, everything dude, is Jim Rohn. Tony, like, you learn just from Jim. Jim. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, I don't know if it was Jim Rohn, but what I often say, and it's right, you always like, you're like, did I make that up or did I read that somewhere? <laughs> totally. I don't know. Yeah, but, but is that um, the secret to success, I feel like, right? We've been taught it's like, you got to do more, you got to grind, you got to work harder, 80 hours a week, right? Like, how bad do you want it? And, and I, along everything that you just talked about to me, it's no, the secret of success is about becoming more. It's not doing more. Like, yes, that's part of it. Yes, you will do more, but here's the thing. The becoming is, the, is it precedes the doing. You become a better version of yourself, a more capable, a more emotionally intelligent, a more resilient version of yourself. First become that person every morning 
and then take on your day mm-hmm. versus waking up going, oh God, work starts in eight, you know, at eight. I've got only got an hour and then I have to face it all again. And, you know, no, it's like you got to get yourself in that peak state in the morning and then. Well, it's funny too, thinking about, I think most people listening to this have some version of a job interview, a mm-hmm. big presentation at work. Uh, you've got to, you know, do a report for school. I feel like we all have these experiences where something was important and so we prepared. Mm. We prepared in advance for this thing that was very important to us. Mm. But 99% of the world's population, and by the way, the ability to prepare is a privilege. We have the time and space. Not everybody gets to live in a place that's safe and allows for that. But if you do, think of how many people are going through each and every day of their life with no preparation. Yeah. They hit the ground running, they wake up, they're in their routine, they're almost immediately going unconscious, meaning we're not thinking, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm making breakfast, I'm getting in the car to go to work. We're not really thinking, we're not grounding ourselves in the moment. We just sort of rush to the next thing and every day's the same, same right? Yeah. So how crazy is it that we will prepare for a job interview or a report at school, but we do not prepare for our life in yeah. any way. We take no preparation of where do I want to go and who do I want to be and how do I want to show up in this space. Yeah. So, I mean, I just feel like this is me and you, like infomercial, like, <laughs> come on guys, get a morning routine. Yeah. So let's say you wake up, you have, we've talked about the idea of silence, meditation, however, prayer, however that shows up for you. What's another, a uh, habit in the morning that you feel like is really so, effective. L- I, let me answer this in a kind of a different way. Um, and I think that'll help like bring it all together. The, so, and, and also I mentioned being granular about the, how did I double my income in 2008? Cause I think for anybody listening right now, it's like, okay, the next recession is upon us. Like, uh, you know, and it's a scary time if you're, I mean, if, if you're anybody, right. Um, Cause it's unknown. It's like, how is this gonna affect my company or my job or my business or so on and so forth. So for me this is how the savers i call this like sequencing the savers how they all kind of support each other so silence something i talk about is emotional optimization meditation so instead of yeah okay. eom emotional optimization meditation instead of meditating just to clear your mind right and there's so many forms of meditation right <laughs> but um Emotional optimization meditation is my favorite. And I, I think I made this up, right? Again, that's one of those things I could probably, I've Googled it, I don't think anybody else made it up, but I think I made it up, but anyway, we're here, neither here nor there. So what it is, is instead of just trying to like clear your mind and just follow your breath for a few minutes, you're actually asking yourself, you're very consciously identifying what is the optimal mental or emotional state for me to be in right now? And right now might mean at this time in my life, it might mean today, cause mm-hmm. I got that job interview, right? Um, and then you answer and it, it, you know, it's not hard to go, I need, I need confidence today. Or I just, I'm tired of feeling unhappy. I wanna freaking be happy. Like I've been there before and you've been there, I'm sure where you're so depressed and unhappy that you're like, it's just, you, you forget how to feel happy. Like that's the scariest thing. I remember in 2020, I had gone through chemo for three years after cancer mm-hmm. and I, for six months, I wasn't sleeping and chemo had messed up my brain. And I, for, I was like, I just like crying to my wife. I'm like, I forgot how to feel happy. Like, I don't remember what it feels like. And that <sighs> is the scariest thing to me. Like, what if I never get it back? And so identifying what's the emotional state that would best serve me right now. And then you get into that state. And like in the book, I kind of walk through some techniques, but the idea is maybe you remember like, well, when was the last time I felt grateful? Yeah. It was when I saw my daughter smile yesterday. Like, okay, I can get into that state. And then once you get in the state, you set your timer for two minutes or five minutes, whatever it is, and you meditate or marinate in that state. And again, you're hardwiring it into your nervous system. So that's my favorite form of meditation. And I do all different kinds. Sometimes I'll just set my timer five minutes ago. I'm just giving myself permission to not think or worry. That's my meditation today. That's my silence. You get permission, Hal. Like I literally someone's like, Hal, do you have permission? You got so much to worry about right now, but for five minutes, you don't have to worry about any of it. And that's like, I'm like, oh my God, this is so nice, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's silence. Um, so the point is to get yourself in a peak state. And whether that's like because you gotta let go of something, whether you gotta just like you talked about disconnecting from your these these things in your subconscious that you've been identifying with, affirmations are my favorite of the savers. I think it's the most misunderstood and mistaught form of personal development, and it's the most effective when you do it right. So the reason I think affirmations have been like, you roll, people roll their eyes at them a lot. One of two reasons. Number one is we're taught to lie to ourselves and, 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 and affirm something that's not true 
as, as if we wish it were true. So for example, if you're struggling financially, you might've been taught by a well-meaning self-help guru to say, just affirm, I am wealthy. I am wealthy. And just say it over and over until you believe, right? Yeah. But if you're if your bank account's negative or, right. or you're right or you're struggling financially and you say I am wealthy, the truth will always prevail. And right. your subconscious, now you're creating an internal conflict yeah. that's like, no, you're not. Yeah. You're broke right now. What and you're like, shut up, I'm doing my affirmations, right? So like you're fighting with yourself. That's the first problem with affirmations, the way that they've been taught. The second is we're taught to use this flowery passive language that promises an almost like magical result independent of any effort. So you, we've all heard this one. I am a money magnet. Yeah, people love I am money. Money flows to me effortlessly and in abundance. That's not how money works. And now it might be better to say that than saying I'm a broke loser. Like, right? right? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> there's some merit. But 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 it's not because here's the the reason I think that affirmation stood the test of time. You just said it. People love it is I think that it's like it's like taking a shot of whiskey or taking like a Xanax where people, you, you look at your phone, your bank balance, and you're like, oh my God, oh, I'm I'm negative or I'm whatever, you know, I'm not in a good place. Uh, I need my affirmations. I am a money magnet. Okay, that feels better. Yeah. That feels better. Money's flowing to me effortlessly. Thank God, because I don't have any motivation. Yeah. And in abundance. And everything's going to magically change because I'm doing effort, right? So those are the two biggest problems with affirmations. I think the way they've been taught and why they have a bad rap and people are like, roll their eyes. Or by the way, if you watched Saturday Night Live in the 90s, right? And there was um, Stuart, Stuart Smiley. Smiley. Yeah. yeah, that gave him a bad rap too. Cause it was like, you know, he made fun of affirmations and like that was in my subconscious. Where I'm like, affirmations are like this goofy thing that, you know, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. So the way that I talk about affirmations, for me, they have to be practical. They have to be actionable. They have to be rooted in truth. Right, so not I am wealthy if I'm not, or I weigh X amount of pounds that I don't, right? Um, and they have to be results oriented. And so here, I'm gonna, get, I'll share right now, I'll break down. These are the three steps that I believe are, for me, they've been the most effective for you creating affirmations that follow that, 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 that framework. Number one is affirm what you're committed to. So if you wanna be wealthy, don't say I am wealthy. Say I'm committed to becoming wealthy or I'm committed to earning X amount of dollars this year, I'm committed to getting a raise, or I'm committed to increasing my revenue by 20 per, like get 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 granular and like, what are you committed to? Because that's what we get in life, what we're committed to. We don't get anything more, don't get anything less. And when you affirm it, here's the beauty of it. When you first read that, you might be like, I'm committed to, like when I was training for an ultra marathon, I hated running and I had never run for more than a mile in PE class and hated it, right? So I'm like, how am I gonna run 52 consecutive miles? But I created an affirmation that said, I am com committed to running 52 consecutive miles on October 29th, 2009, no matter what, there is no other option. The first time I read it, it scared me. The second time I read it, it scared me. Day after day after day though, what you affirm becomes your reality. And eventually I actually acclimated to that commitment until it was like, oh yeah, I'm fully committed. No matter what, I'm going to figure out how to do it. I love That's the word. The power. I love the word committed too, because mm. I wonder how many people just had the realization that like, oh, I want this thing, but I'm not actually committed to it. Because mm. if I look even at my own life, I can see so much success in areas where I'm like, yeah, I am fully committed as a mother. I care deeply about my home, what my children eat, like what's happening at school. I am committed to that. But then if I look at other things, I'm like, that would be so nice. Yeah. But obviously there's not a lot of energy there and there's mm. not a lot happening because I'm not committed to that. And we also have, there's different times in your life where you have the capacity to take on different things, yeah. but having the awareness, even just saying it in the sentence, having the awareness of like, are you interested or committed? Because those yeah. are two completely different things. Yeah. And if you're not committed, yeah, don't expect to see real results. When I think that affirmation totally that, that you know, that says I'm a money magnet, money flows me effortlessly. I don't like, I don't catch any commitment in that statement. Yeah. I catch a very passive, like, I'm just praying for a miracle that money's right. gonna flow into my life, right? Right. And it's like, good, you know, hopefully that works out. Um, the second step is affirm why it's a must for you, right? So I'm committed to blank no matter what, there's no other option, right? You're affirming the commitment. Well, why? Because if you don't have the why, then it's easy to be like, nah, never mind. But if you're like, I'm doing this for me because I deserve it. I'm doing it for my spouse because I've promised them blank. I'm doing it for my kids because they, they are counting on me, right? Like that's where you get the fuel that even when you don't feel like it, you'll do it. And I'll give you a, I'll give you a really, well, let me give you the third step and then I'm gonna share with you like how this saved my life. 
Um, the third step is affirm which specific actions you will take and when. So what are you going to do on what dates, at what times, what durations in order to ensure that you follow through with making that commitment a reality, right? So when I was, so in 2016, I, I was 37 years old. So 17 years after my car accident. And uh, one night I went to the hospital or in the ER, I, I was struggling to breathe and I thought I had pneumonia. Well, days go by, I don't get better. It turns out uh, I'm diagnosed with a very rare aggressive form of cancer called acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is a rare blood cancer that only 6,000 people uh, were alive with at the time, which is probably roughly the same numbers today. And it's, a, it's only a 20 to 30% survival rate. So 70 to 80% of people that get this cancer die. So I'm, I'm told at 37 with a seven-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son that like, this is my new reality. And you know, very quickly, of course, I'm like, my, my, my family was out of town, by the way. So I'm like by myself at home. I've got to call my wife while she's at the zoo in Colorado with my mom and grandma. I couldn't go because I, I thought I was sick. And, um, and I'm calling her to say, uh, don't know how to tell you this but I was just diagnosed with cancer. They need to do more tests. They think it's this really aggressive one. Let's pray that it's not, right? Um, and she's bawling and she's telling my mom who's standing there next to her. <clears throat> and, um, and so I told her, I think it was that conversation. If not, it was as soon as they got home. I said, sweetheart, I know you're terrified because you know the survival rate, it's 20 to 30%. I said, I want you to understand something. And it's funny, I was listening to Nick Santanastasso on your show, and he said almost the exact same thing in how his parents viewed his 30% survival rate at birth. And I hadn't heard that until this morning. But I told my wife, I said, sweetheart, I know you're looking at this statistic, but I want you to understand, that's not a statistic for me. I said, in my mind, there is a 100% chance that I will be among the 20 to 30% of those that survive this because I'll do everything they did and a hundred times more. I'll do everything. I'm going to survive it. You know, and she was like, probably gave her a little bit of hope, but you know, so what happened is this, I ended up having to go to a cancer hospital and my, we didn't want to disrupt my kids life at school and stuff. So they stayed home and my dad and I moved to an apartment three hours away in MD Anderson Cancer Hospital. And there were many days where, you know, I'm really optimistic, I'm really positive, but I would catch myself going, wait, I have to be responsible and plan my affairs. Like, this is weird. How do I maintain unwavering faith that I'm gonna beat this and simultaneously plan for dying and, and making sure my kids are okay and set up? And I'm like, it was really challenging. And so I found myself in a lot of fear of like, well, God, what if I do die and my kids don't have a dad for the, like, what is that gonna look like? And okay, what do I have to do to prepare? And so very quickly, I mean, probably within the first week or so, I, I was like, I need my miracle morning. Like I need to focus all six of the savers on beating cancer. I need to read books on natural ways to beat cancer. I need to meditate in a state of being completely healed. I need to create affirmations that affirm a commitment to beating cancer. I need to visualize walking my daughter <clears throat> down the aisle. <sighs> and, uh, and so following that formula, here's how they played out. And I really believe these saved my life. These were the anchor for the practice, the miracle morning that saved my life. Number one, affirm what you're committed to. I am committed to beating cancer and living to be 100 plus years old alongside Ursula and the kids. <laughs> no matter what, there's no other option. And I affirm that over and over. And remember I said this earlier, what you affirm becomes your reality. And so within a matter of days, maybe a week or so, affirming that day after day, not just in once in the morning, I would also do it at night before bed. I had my affirmations printed on my bedside table. And really quickly, the fear was like, it wasn't even a thought anymore because whenever I felt that fear, I went, wait, this doesn't serve me. I'm committed to beating cancer and living to be hundred plus years old alongside Ursula and the kids, no matter what, there is no other option. And I said it was such conviction and such belief and such faith and such passion and such emotion and energy that it became my reality. And then number two, and this may be the most important part. I mean, I think they're all, all three of these components are equally important. I had five whys. I'm committed to beating cancer for Ursula because I promised her forever and today. I'm committed to beating cancer for my mom and dad because they already lost a child and don't deserve to lose another one. I'm committed to beating cancer for Sophia and Houston because I love them more than life itself. <clears throat> and they need their daddy's love and guidance and leadership. And I'm gonna be here for them. Number four, I'm committed to beating cancer for myself because damn it, I deserve to live a long, <laughs> happy, healthy life. 
And number five, I'm committed to being cancer for the millions of people who are themselves battling cancer or some other disease and may not have been blessed with the knowledge and resources and mindset that I have. And they need me to lead by example so I can show them the way. And those five reasons, Rachel, were so important to me and so meaningful that on the days where I was sick from chemo and I'm like, I can't do it. I'd read the affirmation and be like, oh, I, I will do it. Like, there's no other option. And then the third piece, and I won't go into all the details, but I had a list of like, I will do chemotherapy, but I will do it from a place of believing that my body is strong enough, because most people die from the chemo, right? Mm -hmm. My body is strong enough, the chemo is killing the cancer, I had this written down, but my body will thrive and survive in the midst of it. And then I had a list of, I will relentlessly research every holistic practice known to man. And I did three coffee enemas a week. I took 70 supplements a day. I did lymphatic massage. I did ozone sauna. I met it. I mean, I did every possible practice to naturally heal my body, detox my liver from the chemo toxicity, rebuild my immune system. I'm not leaving it to the doctor and hoping and praying that he saves me. I'm saving myself and he, he's, he's a team member, he's helping out. Visualization, you've touched on this a little bit and this is a huge thing for me. Yeah. Um, this is, again, this is one of those things that I didn't have really words for when I was growing up, but is like, if you're like, Rachel, what is one reason you have the success that you have specifically in business? It is my imagination, wow. period. Yeah. It is from as long as I can remember being a little girl and just visualizing, this is what it's gonna look like when I live in LA. This is what it's gonna look like when I have this house. This is what it's gonna look like. I, I grew up in a lot of chaos. I grew up uh, where my family really struggled financially. And so I latched on to the idea of what it would be like to never have to worry about how you were gonna make rent, mm. what it would be like to have the refrigerator always filled with food. Um, I was just like a little girl and I would have called it daydreaming. Mm. I wouldn't have called that visualization, but that practice stuck with me my whole life. And anytime I took something on, it would just, the amount of times that I saw my name on the New York Times bestseller list before it happened, thousands, wow. I mean, every day. So part of my morning routine is writing down the dreams that I have for my life, but like affirming, I'm a New York Times bestseller, like over and over and over, because I could freaking see it. Yeah. And for me at least, and I know everybody has different modalities, but for me, there is an energy that comes into my body. There's a vibration that raises when I am visualizing something as opposed to just saying it, mm. writing it, it's different if I'm imagining it. Yeah. And I always say like, it's like a movie or you're like watching a movie trailer or whatever. I get this energy in my body and it changes my state. So one of the things I always like, at least for me, is if you're not feeling an emotional charge in your body yeah. when you are visualizi visualizing, something's off it's mm. no, you're not tapped in or there's something that you need to like it's a different way of looking at it or it could even be sort of the cognitive dissonance you're talking about with affirmations that don't feel real there's something about that that isn't like landing for you yeah. so i would love it if you take listeners through what's the visualization practice like for you and how do you even come up with what am i imagining yeah. First of all, I'm going to play what you just shared with for my daughter and my son, like over and over and over, because my daughter has this dream of being a Hollywood actress, you know, right? And like, I did too. This is really, really practical. I think that's one thing for me. I think that's why the Miracle Morning has resonated with people because I'm like, things have to be really simple for me. Like, you know, I always say, am I a simpleton? I don't know, maybe, but like, I really need to simplify especially like an esoteric practice or something that's, you know, not concrete. I'm like, I need it to be really concrete. So the visualization, the way that I do it, and actually let me start by saying the reason I think that also people struggle with that practice is that we've been taught by, again, very well-meaning self-help gurus um, only to visualize the end result and that's it. Uh, make a vision board and put things on it that you want. You want your body to look like that. You want to live there. You want, right? And it's it just visualize the end result. So if you're thinking about like a marathon, it's like just see yourself crossing the finish line so you know what that feels like and then you'll be motivated to get there. There is value to that, but to me, it's only half of the equation, if you will, and there's a more important part to make visualization effective. So two steps. Number one, yes, visualize the end result. See what it's going to look like, and more importantly, and you said this, like feel 
What will that feel like to find the person of your dreams? Like I know right now, maybe they're not there and you can't find them and you have bad relationships, but just imagine, allow yourself, give yourself permission to imagine if it were to work out exactly as you wanted it to, what would that look like? What would that feel like, right? So you do that first so that you're, and the reason for that is, oh, that's, that's, that's motivating. I want, I want that, right? And now you're getting out of your limitation of like, well, but I'm not there and I can't be where, you know, I'm not where I want to be and I'm not making progress. No, imagine yourself there. But to me, that's the least important part. And the most important part is visualize yourself doing the thing you need to do today and put yourself in a peak state doing the thing. Because usually the thing we need to do is the thing that we're afraid of. It's the thing that's out of our comfort zone. It's the thing that's uncomfortable. It's the thing that maybe even just it's easier not to do. So I won't do it, right? So I'll give you a very concrete example. So I hated running. I mentioned that for the ultra marathon I was training for. I bought a book called The Non-Runner's Marathon Trainer, which is literally, if you hate running, here's how you approach a marathon. Because you have to do it differently than someone that like, oh no, I already love running and I've done a 5K, right? Like very different than I've never run before. So I bought that book and that helped me with like the psychology and the training plan. Then I did my affirmations. I'm committed to running the marathon. Here's why I'm doing it. Here's what I'm gonna do to get there. Then the visualization, I would only take like maybe 60 to 120 seconds and I, that was visualizing the finish line. And I literally printed out the Atlantic City Marathon finish line. I Googled it, printed it so I could actually see. Smart. That's what it looks like, right? So I would close my eyes and imagine myself breaking through, like I was gonna be first. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I saw, right? So breaking through the finish line and that got me excited. Like I want that to be a reality. Okay, now what do I have to do to get there? And then I would visualize my cell phone, which was sitting in front of me on my coffee table where I was doing the Miracle Morning in my living room. And I'd visualize 7 a.m. Beep, beep, beep. And I would hear beep, 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 beep. And I would visualize my hand reaching out and turning it off. Then I would visualize getting off my couch, going into my bedroom, into my closet, getting dressed in my running clothes. Then I would visualize walking back through the living room. And this only takes like probably three minutes, maybe three or four. Um, I visualize myself reaching out almost like like a video game those where like you can see the yeah, hand reach yeah, out in yeah. front, right? Like the shooter games or whatever. Yeah. I would I may see my hand reach out, turn the doorknob, open the door, then I would see my driveway and I would see the sidewalk. And while I had my eyes closed sitting on my couch, seeing the sidewalk, I would go through my affirmations one more time with energy and conviction and passion. I'm committed to running 52 miles on October 29th, 2009. No matter what, there is no other option. I'm doing this to be not to run a marathon, but to become the version of myself that can do anything that I ever commit to doing. That was my why. In order to do that, I will read the non-runners marathon trainer and I will follow the training plan to a T and then while I was visualizing it and feeling that energy, I would see myself with, with like excitement go on the run. And here's for everybody, I want you to understand, I want, I'm gonna break this apart for you, why this is so effective so that you can apply this in any area of your life. Um, I was seeing myself do the thing that I had to do, but I was mentally rehearsing. And that to me, when you say visualization, it's, it's a really loose word. It, it, it can be interpreted in a lot of ways. And I think that's why people struggle with it. Mental rehearsal, for me, makes it way more concrete. Yeah, right? and it's like every athlete, every yep. Olympian, everybody has talked about this in Look It Up, yep. that that is a crucial component in why they are at the level of excellence that they're at, totally. is that they mentally rehearse every single part of it, like lacing up their shoes, yep. walking down the hallway to the arena. Like it is such a common practice. And I love that flip too, mm. because visualization could be anything. Yeah. Mental rehearsal is very specific. Yeah, yeah, you see yourself doing the thing. And then, and here's how it played out in real time. When my alarm on my phone at 7 a.m. started going beep, 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 human nature would have been to turn it off and go, eh, I'll run tomorrow. I can, I can miss a day, which we all know turns into two, turns into three, turns into, oh yeah, I was in on a marathon last year, whatever happened to that, I don't know, I just, all right? That's, and that's for most of us, that's reality. But the power of this technique, this way of doing mental rehearsal, a visualization is that when the alarm went up at 7 a.m., I didn't mentally rehearse turning it off and sitting on the couch. So that's not what happened every day. It's almost like being a robot in the best possible sense of the word, where I program myself, like when the alarm went off at 7 a.m., 
without thinking automatically my subconscious got me off the couch i walked into my closet without even thinking about it without talking myself out of it i did exactly what i rehearsed got dressed went out and it's, it's funny as soon as i opened the front or not funny but as soon as i opened that front door and saw the sidewalk the affirmations just popped into my head and the emotions popped into my head and that i think is the most important part is it's the athletes, right? They, they see themselves on the court and they feel what's it gonna feel like to be confident and to be at my best. But wait a minute, and most of them plan for contingencies. Wait, what's gonna happen if we're down? What's gonna happen if I miss my first seven shots in a row or 10 shots in a row? Then they mentally rehearse responding to challenges in adversity so that when life is actually happening, you go, oh, I've already been here. I've been yeah. here my mind, my body, my spirit, like my emotions. I know what to do because I already rehearsed doing the right thing in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. And it sounds like that one too, if that was your visualization, leads really beautifully into E, uh, yeah. which is exercise. exercise. Uh, so why, I mean, I know the answer uh, to this, but we're gonna pretend I don't. Yeah. Why is moving your body so essential? So I'll, I'll reference Robin Sharma uh, was in the Miracle Morning documentary, and he said the benefits of exercise, the physical, mental, um, and emotional benefits of exercise, and you could argue spiritual, um, have been scientifically proven to last as long as 13 hours after the initial exercise, right? So the, the, the biological processes that happen in our body benefit us. And here's the thing is a lot of people ask me, well, why do I have to do the miracle morning? Like, couldn't I do that? Like I get the savers are like life changing, you know, in, in, in and of them like individually. So you put them all together. Okay. Yeah, that, that's going to be very impactful, but couldn't I do them later in the day or in the evening? Um, and the answer is absolutely. But you've now missed out on the benefits all day long. The benefits of meditation where it lowers your cortisol, helps you feel centered and grounded, improves your mental health, right? Yeah. You don't want to wait you don't want to miss out on those all day and just get them before for the last few minutes before bed. So um, exercise specifically, you don't have, I want to make this, I want to really simplify it for people. You don't have to go to the gym in the morning. This is literally, it could be as little as 60 seconds of jumping jacks. In fact, there's a chapter in the book called the six minute miracle morning, which I don't recommend that every day is six minutes, but it's, it's, it's basically like an all, it, it helps you overcome the all or nothing mentality, which is like, well, I like to do a 30 minute miracle morning or an hour, but I only have like 10 minutes. There's no point. It's like, no, one minute of, Silence is very grounding. One minute reading your most important affirmations can really focus you for the day. One minute of mentally rehearsing that first activity, greeting your kids, going to whatever it is, right? One minute of jumping jacks. <sighs> You're breathing heavy, blood and oxygen to the brain. So it's not only a physical benefit, you are now thinking more clearly. You have more discipline if you exercise first thing in the morning. So again, it could be a one minute workout. It could be a seven minute workout. It could be, you know, right? Any, any moving your body in the morning and go for a quick walk just got to get your body moving in the morning yeah and then we've talked a bit about reading we both love reading in the morning sort of filling filling our head with some great knowledge but scribing yeah. which is journaling too i'm yeah. really curious about your journaling practice so it used to be uh two parts and then now i added a third um and the third is the, is on the front end so the first thing i ask myself now is is there anything that i need to let go of and right, because if you try to go straight to like gratitude, but you're, the, you know, you've got this like this tense, you're tense, you're stressed, you're angry, you're scared over the thing you were me worrying about the night before, you're trying to go straight to gratitude. It's like, by it's like spiritual bypass, right. right? And so the first thing is like, oh yeah, I'm still upset over that argument I had yesterday, or I'm, I'm so scared of the state of the world right now. Like that's just there. And just the power, the magic, and you know this, of putting pen to paper and getting it out of your head and on paper and you go, oh wow, it's not who I am. It's right. not, I don't have, I, I now have permission to not worry about it because it's in my journal and I could go look at it whenever I want. So I don't have to stress about it and let it consume me. Yep. So that's the first thing, what I need to let go of. Number two is um, what am I grateful for? And I always say there's a big difference between in intellectual gratitude and heartfelt gratitude. Mm -hmm. Intellectual gratitude is if I were to ask anybody, what are you grateful for? They'd be like, um, my house, check, my house, my, my they, which is, it's like a list. Yeah. yeah. Versus for me, I'll write down my daughter, Sophia, right? And I'll, but, but then I stop and I put my hand on my heart and I close my eyes and I picture her as a baby. And then as a toddler, like I'll take just 60 seconds, yeah. right? And I'll, 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 my hand on my heart and I'll just feel like deep gratitude for her. And I forgot what the name of this is, but you know, there's that technique where you imagine life without the thing mm. for just a moment, right? If that thing, if you didn't have, and, and that just gives you just like an ounce of pain to go, oh my God, the, oh, wow, 
Like that contrast yeah. really makes you more grateful. Uh, so that's number two. And then number three is I look at my to-do list for the day, which is always, I've got 60 things in my Trello or whatever, right? Like, and I'm like, okay, what's the number one thing that will move the needle in my life or my business today more than anything else so that I'm not busy, but I'm actually productive and I have to get that thing done. Then I can move on to what's number two and then number three. So I identify the three most important things in writing in order. And that is a perfect segue from my savers into my work day. Cause now I'm like, all right, I know the number one thing that I need to get done before I get down to everything else. So cool. I love the, the reminder again, this going back to like tapping into emotion is I think that sometimes with the gratitude practice, people get in the habit of just like, I'm going to think of the things or I'm going to write the things down very quickly, but they don't take that into their being. They're just sort of like, I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful for that. Yep. And if you're not having an, a positive emotional response to that gratitude, you are not slowing down enough to feel it. Yeah. And if you're not feeling it, it's not helping you the way it's that it could. It's having almost like yeah. very little impact. Yeah. yeah, and so my, the way that I do gratitude practice is what is something that has happened within the last 24 hours mm. that I mm. can feel grateful for. Mm. And I do this because it challenges me then, I've done it for so long, it's not very hard, but it challenges you to be present all day, mm. to look all day. If you know that you're going to write down five things tomorrow morning that happened in the last 24 hours you don't write down my house you don't write down yeah. the big stuff That's such a good point you write down the cup of coffee you write down i'm always talking about dogs i see on my walk like oh my god i saw a weenie dog which is my favorite <laughs> dog like oh this ha you know it's these really simple yeah. things and i feel like i've been doing a lot of work lately on um tapping into my spirit, like our inner spirit mm. and what that actually is. And I've realized, it's so funny, cause you know, we teach as teachers, you teach what resonates for you and you hope that it resonates for other people. Yeah. But I had this realization, I'm, I'm doing a, a course right now about this subject. And I was like, oh, my inner spirit loves the little things, mm. loves simple pleasures, loves when I see a butterfly, loves the coffee. Lo and listeners are maybe giggling because they've been around a long time. They've heard me talk about these things over and over. And it was the first time I realized, oh, that's what I find gratitude for. Mm. But you, Sophia, Jack, whoever's listening to this, your gratitude practice may be totally different. But I think the thing that is unifying for us all is that that emotion needs to hit you. Because if the emotion hits you, it raises your vibration, it puts you into state. And from that like place of abundance, I just feel like life is better. You see more possibility, you see more connection, you're open, your heart's open. That is the most life-changing practice I know of. I'm changing my gratitude practice to what happened in the last 24 Good. hours. That, no, that is, that, it, I yeah. love that. I really love yeah. that. And, uh, and sometimes that happens, right? Like I, all the day I'll end up falling asleep and I'll go like, oh, this morning I was on Rachel Hollis's podcast. <laughs> it's <laughs> funny know? how we just, really don't take yeah. into, like if you don't make yourself slow down or even um, I have a, I, a lot of times this hit me yesterday too. I'm like, where was I a year ago today? Where was mm. I a year ago today? And I, I used the photos on my phone to know where I totally. was a year ago today. Yeah. And a year ago today, I took my kids on spring break and it was a month after their dad passed away. Mm. And we went on spring break because they were supposed to go on spring break with him. And last minute I was just like, okay, I just wanna get them out of here, wanna get them out of this space. And the picture that came up on my phone was them on spring break. And I just remember all of us sort of being like, what? We don't even know what our mm. life is, what is happening? Um, and I was so grateful. I feel like it was a nudge from like an angel or a spirit guide or someone to just be like, look at look at today. Today in mm. March, it was you were at peace. You had a good day. The sun was shining. The kids are healthy. They're happy. Mm. They're thriving at school. A year ago, I didn't know what we were gonna do. Yeah. And that if you don't slow down yeah. and like be conscious of that, because there's no guarantee that two months from now, something crazy could happen again and you are you just don't know. Yeah. So if you don't like pull yourself into this present moment in some way, it like you miss it. You'll miss like appreciation for what this is right now, yeah. which is what we've got. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, 
it it reminds me of, uh, and I don't know, again, don't know where to learn stuff, but um, I, I often, I try to live by the best moment of my life is every moment. Mm. And if you think about it, if I were to ask, if you ask anybody, when, you know, what was the best moment in your life? They, usually their, their eyes would go up, you know, and they're like, hmm. And they would start to try to think of these extraordinary moments, right? Oh, my birth of my child or my wedding day or the vacation to Hawaii, right? And it's like almost like we have to, we got to compete. Okay, well, what was the, no, no, I got a better moment than that, right? Not with each other, but with ourselves. Like, well, what's the best moment? It's a lot of pressure. And what I realized is that the best moment of our life is literally every moment if we choose to experience it as such and to define it as such. And, and the beauty of it is, so I'll do, like, I just, I'll call it out. I'll go, this is the best moment of my life because I'm sitting here on Rachel Hollis's comfy chair <laughs> looking at you and getting to have a face-to-face -face conversation with you. Jack is over there smiling. Yeah. He's awesome. My daughter is here to witness this, right? Like, this is literally yeah. how... I would challenge anyone to argue this isn't the best moment of my life. Yeah. But then like a week ago, me and my son were playing in the backyard, playing basketball. And I was like, thank you, God. This is literally the best moment of my life because I'm playing with my son. But also, if I'm like reading a book or yeah. doing a miracle morning or yeah. walking outside or getting the mail or grocery shop, it's the best moment of my life. And the beauty of that is that everybody listening to this has, that's available to you. That's available to you. Right. And part of the, my miracle morning, one of my affirmations is, thank goodness, it's to remind me, hey, Hal, remember today that this is the best day of your life because you're choosing to experience it as such. And every moment and experience them as many of them as you can, every moment will be the best moment of your life today. So cherish everyone. And by the way, you'll notice that's not following that one, two, three formula because there's many ways to do affirmations. But that's one of my most important affirmations. It just reminds me like, this is it. And my quality of life because of that best moment, best day ever philosophy, radically transformative. So cool. Yeah. How this has been an absolute pleasure. I know the audience is gonna get so much out of it. They're gonna wanna dive in more. They're gonna wanna get the book. Will you tell them where do they find you online? Where do yeah. they hang out with you on social? Like yeah. give them all the details. Miraclemorning.com is the hub. You can watch the documentary for free there. Um, you can obviously get the books, you know, links to the books there. Um, the Miracle Morning app, which is doing really well, that that you can find that at miraclemorning.com. So that's the hub. And then my social media, um, Instagram is like at Hal underscore Elrod. Some realtor got Hal Elrod, which bums me out. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so I'm on all the, you know, you can find me on Facebook or on Instagram. I'm probably most active on Instagram. But yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Rachel, this, this is been... like exceeded my expectations. Oh, good. I, you're such a joy. I oh. really appreciate you.